this episode is brought to you by Tanmay Shah. That's me. Best way to support this show is by sharing this with your friends and dropping a comment and review on YouTube, Apple Podcasts and Spotify. You can become my patron and a sponsor. That's not all. You can buy Rockla's merchandise and NFTs and much more. See all the links in description for details. Rockla's Radio. Rockla's. 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 Rockla's Radio with Tom Maisha. Hello there. Welcome to another episode of Rockla's Radio. On today's show, we have with us a serial entrepreneur art collector md at my line we venture capitalist fund co-founder of alpha capital let go olx d remate world economic forums young global leader member of the latin american and caribbean fund of museum of modern arts and art ba also a harvard business school graduate Welcome on the show to Mr. Alec Oxenford. How are you doing today? Very well. Thank you very much, Tanmay. It's a pleasure to be talking to you and to your audience in uh, in India, which is a country I like very much. Amazing. You have got so much experience and you're, you're into so many things. What do you think is your biggest accomplishment? <laughs> um... <laughs> I think, you know, one is, and I'm an entrepreneur and an art collector and, um, and a few other things, but I think the most important thing is that we are entrepreneurs of our lives. No, we create our lives. So I, I would be happy to say, and I would like to be able to say that, uh, my biggest accomplishment is to learn, you know, and to become a, a better version of myself. Uh, you know, in each, in each, uh, in each mini life I'm living um, as as entrepreneur of different companies and uh, all the experiences I'm living. So I, I'm not sure I have a a physical accomplishment or a monetary accomplishment or a business accomplishment. Uh, I think it's more um, being increasingly uh, in peace and happy with. Uh, with myself and my environment and having better relationships um, all the time and deeper relationships. Too. Yeah. Mm. Very interesting. So it's the, for you, accomplishments are not goal setting and accomplish, accomplishing them. They are more having a fulfilling life. Is that what you're saying? I think so. I'm going in that direction, you know, um, some time ago, uh, I would say that I had one big goal, which was to become a billionaire, but not in the usual sense of becoming a billionaire, which is, you know, having a billion dollars or something. It was more on the sense of touching the lives of a billion people, being able to somehow uh, influence positively a billion people. And in, in that sense, you know, through OLX, and uh, let go and dermati and indirectly via myelin you know according to my rough estimations that number is like 650 million or something so i'm still not there but uh you know but some people have actually uh, you know hopefully uh, been positively impacted by things impacted by things i i do which which is which is very fulfilling you know it makes me feel makes me feel good well, India is a country of 1.4 billion people and OLX is very well known. So by that standard, I believe you have already reached a billion. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but yeah, it could be. It could be. Uh, I hope so. You know, India is indeed uh, so different from Argentina, right? But also uh, similar in the sense that uh, many nice people there. <laughs> yes. I like that. You know, we have a simple way to connect, very direct and a good sense of humor. Those, those are good things for both countries. What is your impression of India? Like, what was it when you got to know about it first time and what is it now? <laughs> well, it's, um, it's a very, very different 
plays from, from Argentina in many aspects, right? Um, for example, ju ju just to take a, um, some of the key differences, and there's also some similarities, but some of the key differences. India is very populated. You mentioned, you know, 1.4 billion people. Argentina is only 45 million people. So India is 31 times larger in population than Argentina, 31 times larger. <laughs> but interestingly, Argentina is 2.8 million square kilometers. India is 3.3. So India is only 15% larger than Argentina. Actually, India is the number seven country in the ranking according to size. And Argentina is the number eight. We're relatively close in terms of size. But India has 31 times more inhabitants, which means you see, it's a very different, we are like a small, small province of India, <laughs> almost, a, yeah, it's, 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 it's a very, 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 very different. On the other hand, Argentina, you know, is, is, is diverse in the sense that we have um, immigration, it's, it's an immigration country, so it, it, it was populated basically through European immigration and coming from many different places, so in that sense it's a bit diverse. But it's also very homogeneous because it's mostly European um, and it's mostly Catholic. There's some Jewish population, but most, mostly Catholic. India is a lot more diverse. You know, you have multiple languages. We have only Spanish. You have multiple languages, multiple religions. Um, I would say multiple cultures within India, whereas in Argentina, it's a lot more, um, a, a, a lot more homogeneous. Uh, also, the food. Food in Argentina is, uh, we like beef a lot. We like um, pasta, pizza, um, um, but it's relatively simple. I think that food in India is a lot richer. You know, there's a lot more variety, more, it's more, a lot more spicy. Uh, <laughs> there's a, both countries on the other hand, some have some similarities. We have a, a, a lot of variety in the nature. You know, we have, we go from, you know, very tall mountains. Yeah, the tallest mountain in the Western Hemisphere is Aconcagua in Argentina. Uh, you have very tall mountains in India, particularly in the north, but you also have valleys and a lot of coasts, just like Argentina. You have, I think, more cultural monuments, like the very famous Taj Mahal. We have nothing like the Taj Mahal in, in, in Argentina. You have cities like uh, Jaipur, you know, very well known for the historic heritage. We don't, we didn't exist. That at, at the time that the Taj Mahal was being built and that Jaipur was being built, there was nothing. It was empty, barren land because um, they, they were the, the the few inhabitants that that lived in Argentina. They they lived in a in a corner of Argentina. It was mostly barren. There was literally it was almost in, uninhabited. So uh, you know there was there was nothing. Whereas you have a culture for a very long period of time, no? So um, there's similarities and, 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 and big differences. I think both countries are, uh, on the other hand, have a very clear, um, uh, uh, when you say Indian or you say Argentinian, people, something comes to their mind, you know? There's countries that globally have, uh, uh, have an image. And I think like that, that's cool. Um, you have developed some, for example, India has developed some uh, interesting, uh, very interesting clusters like Bollywood. Uh, we don't have a, a Bollywood. However, uh, Argentinian cinema and movies are actually quite well known. And given the size, which is relatively small, uh, they're quite good. You know, there's, there's been Oscars won by Argentinian films. Um, they're considered, you know, very interesting. Woody Allen, the 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 the, the country outside of, of the U.S. or more people more people like Woody Allen, who's a sophisticated filmmaker, is Argentina. It's a, it's a strange place. We love tango and, and music and dancing, which which uh, and sports. Of course, you have uh, uh, you know football here. So football, soccer, right? So very very big in in uh, in Argentina. Like every really World big famous. in famous. <laughs> But it's great. I mean, uh, you have cricket. I understand, you know, and it's a, uh, it's uh, you know, very, very important there. So, um, I don't know. There's similarities and differences, but for us, the image of India is a, is a very, 
very interesting place, a place of magic, you know, a place of uh, wonders. <laughs> that, that's what we have in our minds. Yes. You know, you said Argentina was a place of migrants. It just clicked to me that India is a country of having diaspora. It has the world's biggest diaspora. I mean, every country has Indians in it <laughs> going and settling in that country. So that is a fun fact. And I was seeing the map. I'll show it to the audience uh, sometime later on. But if you see, look at the map. Okay, let me just pull it. It looks like Argentina is giving a high five to Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> that could be it yes <laughs> yeah we have a Argentina is a very long country from north to south so it goes all the way from tropical uh, tropical regions and jungles in the north to very icy um, you know icy places and, and all the way to Antarctica no? so yeah it, 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 we have uh, only one um, time zone but we have multiple um, climates because of it going from mm. north to south. No? So, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting place. And as you are in the southern hemisphere, it must be like um, winter for you right now. <laughs> that, that is correct. We, we are in winter here and it's, uh, it's not that cold in Buenos Aires because Buenos Aires is relatively to the north of Argentina, which is, which is, yeah, which is uh, relatively warmer. But down south, yeah, it's snowing and uh, really cold. Mm. It's a very interesting place. And as uh, Messi has made it famous for football, and you had uh, other players also who are very famous for football. Uh, very, very nice to know that. A lot of fun facts to talk about Argentina. Um, but before that, coming pulling back the conversation to you, in such a diverse experience that you had, what do you think was the most challenging part and how did you overcome? Most challenging parts. Interesting question. Um, I think in some dimensions, the first time I became an entrepreneur, which was with Derimati, it was imagine kind of an eBay clone for Latin America something like that. That was, in some dimensions, the hardest because it was the first time I was doing it. No, it was very new. Um, so for the first time in my life, I had to hire people. Um, I, previous to that, I had worked as a consultant uh, with the Boston Consulting Group, which is a, it's, it's a, it's, it's a good consulting firm. Um, and I had studied in, in, in Harvard Business School, which, which was a very good experience, but it, it was theoretical, right? Like it wasn't that, even though it's a case study, it's supposedly more practical than reading books, it still is theoretical, right? Because you're not doing it. So um, I think the hardest was to actually, you know, jump into the opportunity of uh, becoming an entrepreneur and uh, raising raising money. The first round was, it was, it was the hardest by, by far, because I had never done it. So I didn't know exactly how to do it. And uh, we had to learn in the process and adjust very quickly. I uh, remember we had like, what was it? It was like 150 meetings <laughs> to on the phone mostly and some in person to, to raise money. Um, it, was, it was brute force. Uh, we talked to everybody, <laughs> everybody. It was, and you know, until we actually understood what people wanted to hear and how to prepare a good presentation. It, it took several iterations, you know, it took several rounds and eventually we did it. We, we were able to, to raise the money, but both raising the money, hiring the people, um, building the, the first product, all those first experiences were particularly challenging because it was, you know, it was the first time being an entrepreneur and you don't, you don't know anything. You're, you're learning while doing, right? It's like, it's like building a, a plane uh, when you're flying, you know, it's uh, not that easy. So, but it was, it was, it was also phenomenally gratifying. I loved it. Building a plane when you're flying. Wow. Where say to put it, you know, you mentioned hiring the first team and raising the first uh, round of fundings. I, I, I think I'm also in a similar position and 
many of the listeners are also in the same part so i mean <coughs> you don't know which team to find how you will find the team members and even after you have found them it's your responsibility to uh, pay their salaries on time and make every make take care of them and for paying the salary you need a certainty of the next funding so how if you are starting now what advice would you give to the young entrepreneurs <laughs> uh, there's lots of things i would i would love that somebody told me <laughs> when i was getting started no so some of the things would be um of course it's very important to work a lot and uh you know be very disciplined but it it is also very important to have fun in the process yeah this this i didn't know and actually was the first in the office the last to leave worked all day you know and thought that you know it was important that i sacrificed a lot etc and yeah you have to work a lot of course you know it's you know you need to compete and 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 be being competitive means working very often more than the other guy but but it's also critical to have fun um i learned uh, that when you have fun when you're really having fun you're enjoying yourself uh, the best of you comes out and you can be a lot more productive if if there's a, a honest enthusiasm behind what you're doing so um i think there's a uh, you know there's a correlation between having fun being enthusiastic being yourself being productive and having impact and and that's something that, that's not in any business school book you know or it, it's not in the standard playbook but making sure that you you operate with a team where they can be themselves and really contribute the best they have and in order for that to happen they need to be they need to feel relaxed and in order for that to happen they need to have fun so uh, just making sure that people that you create that environment with your team where people can 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 fail can sometimes be you know make fools of, the, of themselves which is a requirement uh, in the testing process that that leads to building better things so um, it's got it's a bit counterintuitive no because you have to allow failure to get to success you have to um allow people to be a bit foolish so that they can actually be super serious and managing those uh, ambiguities in in a smart way i think is is something not very intuitive and 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 that i would have loved somebody to tell me uh, when i was getting started um some of the things maybe um you know dream big dream big there's no um you know the sky's the limit it sounds a bit cliche but it's true it takes the same 24 hours a day to do whatever it is you want you want to do and you can be building the taj mahal or you can be you know building something this big and uh, you know it's 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 it, it, it's up to you you know so don't limit yourself that's the other thing i would i, I would tell a young entrepreneur just think big think big think global think big smile a lot and bring over people um you admire you know i think the best scenario for an entrepreneur is that that their team is actually better than themselves uh, so don't feel threatened by others don't feel that you need to be in control <laughs> that's hard hard for an entrepreneur because we are very control freaks so at least i am and but just uh, make sure that you actually build people who are actually better and who can complement you and bring over the skills that you don't have sometimes people are reluctant to do this because you feel a bit threatened or vulnerable if other people are better than you in some very clear dimensions but that that's actually the best thing you can do so that the whole uh, team is more effective no um yeah those are a few of the things and amazing and I, 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 one other thing is don't forget that uh, you know our our life may look it may seem long it's actually quite short you know you don't have time to build 100 companies in your life you know if you are really 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 you can off the charts you may build three or four you know and and so so you know focus on doing something important a dream you know? big 
yes hmm. dream big have fun uh focus on important things lovely and have a have, have make it fun for the environment and lose a bit of control let <laughs> let <laughs> yes. others uh take the whole my my dream with the podcast is to talk to experts like you from every single country on the in the world like within within a month or two and then the next goal but i'm very thrilled to uh, be doing that the second aspect you mentioned uh, in the discussion was about the finance and with your venture fund mylin you are paying money to smart people to coat who are building cool shit <laughs> uh in a in a very in a very broad sense uh starting from space energy biotech saas food mobility and everything you are a polymath so with this with this fund how do you choose a startup to invest in well, sorry how do we do what excuse me can you repeat how the question how do you choose Uh, yeah, how yeah. do you choose yes sorry just, just the connection broke up a second um well yeah, it's uh, first of all thanks for the introduction and uh, it's it's uh, <laughs> some of the the ways that we describe what we do which you describe with a big smile is uh, is actually to do that to accomplish that no to 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 present ourselves to the world in a in a slightly differentiated way you know we're a bit more informal and a bit uh, a bit more um, Uh, laid back than, than others but on the other hand we really care about what we're doing and we care about the world and we think that we are doing something interesting so how do we pick uh, the companies um we have um uh we're very lucky because uh, the three founders of of of, of Mylin uh, uh Matthias Nissenson uh, one of my partners um a, a crypto guru and the guy who's who's been successful and built companies um and all the way from inception to selling them martin varsavsky um you know he's like an entrepreneur uh, genius and he's built uh, like five unicorns and myself uh, myself also having built a couple of unicorns and uh, built companies from inception to uh, exit and because of this we have developed a a good reputation in, in multiple markets including in the US which is our main focus and so we receive inbound projects uh, which is the first way we actually uh, we connect with and uh, with with founders you know we receive we received in mylin is you know roughly it's it's roughly a year and a half old uh, and in that time um, i don't remember the exact number but it's literally thousands of projects that we have seen and most of them inbound we've heard um, we've heard about the coolest things happening uh, in the US and but also in other uh, geographies uh, from people just knocking at our doors they send us the projects once they once they do that and maybe 75% or 80% of the projects that we see uh, are you know they're organically received inbound by um, you know just founders sending us their their teasers their presentations etc so what happens then yeah you know, we have a team that actually um very quickly um reads these these materials and uh, you know uh, looks at them um through uh, some lenses uh, that include um uh, the quality of the founders we want to find founders who actually we believe have a, a potential to build unicorn companies um we looked we look at the uh the market you know the total addressable market of of the opportunity i mean how big can this become is is it really something that can change the world we also like very much um disruptive things you know uh, technologies that are uh, that that are new in some dimension you know sometimes it's a new application sometimes it's something new completely new um but we like we like to push the the the, the frontier of um of what's going on you know um that's something we like very much as well and of course we like um we like teams we like uh, teams that are that work well together that can um articulate a vision clearly 
and that have and then of course companies that have some traction even though we don't require the companies to be profitable but we do require the companies to have um uh, in most cases um some revenue you know that that they can prove that some customers are already happy to pay for the services and other products that they're being shipped um this is important because um we we really believe that until that moment it, it's very hard to assess uh, whether the company has a future or not uh, because you don't know yet whether it just is a you know a very good uh, vision <laughs> but without any reality in it or whether actually people and the users are actually uh, starting to voluntarily choose that uh, that company you know? so um, great founders ideally repeat founders but not necessarily uh, founders who can scale with the business all the way to becoming a unicorns big markets markets where we believe the the size of the market is uh, enormous um, uh, great teams um, and activity already uh, in in terms of um, at least some revenues are some of the things that we look at is it i'm trying to imagine a myelin version of shark tank how would that be <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know we we are, we are um the way we operate is not we're not that public right we're very private in some way we're very informal and very for example we have a a whatsapp group um uh, and we're on whatsapp all day for example i woke up early this morning and we chatted a bit it was uh, like 5:45 in the morning here when we <laughs> talked today and uh i had already chatted with uh with 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 my part actually with the full team we have a partners group and also a full team group in in and we're talking about uh, about threads you know the the new social network that 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 was launched a few days ago by uh, instagram and um it's a uh, you know it's great that you can actually connect with that level of informality you know multiple times a day etc and so amongst ourselves we're super open and very very um we're connected all the time and really enjoy Uh, that interaction and are very 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 direct um but on the other hand never thought of you know openly uh having those conversations with others because i think we would we would lose a bit of a bit of the um the secret sauce of island which has to do with the um on the one hand the complementarity that the, that the team has but also the intimacy and the trust that we've been able to to generate no yeah I don't know. So when every, somebody's every team has a secret sauce, you know. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. When somebody's trying to apply, um do you is it open to worldwide or is it just for Latin America? One question. Second is, do they have to reach a certain level of revenue or turnover to apply or at what level can they apply? Second question. Yes. Yeah. Well, in in terms of team members, yeah, um, um we don't i mean people from anywhere is com- are, are they are completely welcome right we 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 love diversity etc how there's one restriction however which is in order to be able to work efficiently um you know the time zones need to be more or less aligned right because if people are sleeping when you know that that that's a bit of a problem but um but we're completely we we love diversity and are very open uh, in terms of the of the projects um i'd say almost slightly below 80% of our projects come from the us so we look at um projects globally but most of the our, of our focus is the us because um the still we believe that still a big chunk of uh, what's going on uh, in terms of technology at, at, at that very early stage that we focus on you know the the the, the big 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 changing um you know that the, the, the what we believe are the most interesting companies are still being born mostly in the US this is changing right even india is 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 generating um 
great companies. And I believe that, you know, at some point, probably uh, a big chunk of the, big, of, the, of the global tech companies will not be U.S. focused. But today, if you look at the top 20 technology companies, most of them are in the U.S. still today, right? And if you, if, and, and if you look at the top five, all of them are in the U.S. So it's a... Uh, um, you know, it, it, there's a lot of, 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 of U.S. focus still when you're talking about developing technology. And it has to do, there's nothing, you know, too complicated to um, imitate, I think. It's just that it hasn't happened yet. But um, I think it has a lot to do with the rule of law and, uh, and with the fact that, um, you know, people are fine um, being entrepreneurs uh, and failing and starting over and and the system doesn't um, uh, you know uh, punish you for that for example I, I was talking to an entrepreneur the other day who had been an entrepreneur in in China and he mentioned that China is a fascinating market it's so big and lots of, of technology and you know phenomenal I mean the population is enormous and all the rest but he said that there was a problem there because culturally failing was a was a problem so if you failed, it was complicated that you would get resources the second time around. You know, people would not, it was a bit of a shame, you know. Um, that's not, well, and, and, and in terms of India, India has uh, proven, uh, you know, such fantastic people. Uh, many of the big, these biggest companies I was mentioning are actually managed by Indians in the U.S., <laughs> so, so, so even even though the companies were not born in, in in India, it's the Indians that are controlling them already. It just shows what talent uh, you know India has as as, as a talent pool. No, very impressive. Uh, Absolutely, I, I, think, I think it's the number one uh, demographic group in terms of top positions in technology globally. India already. Absolutely. And um, it is growing so fast. I just want to update you that a city like Dubai or Singapore is being developed in India, in, in Ahmedabad, uh, near Ahmedabad. It's called Gift City, where you can set up a business and do transaction in US dollars. And there is no income tax for 10 years. And there are a lot of other benefits from the government, just like Dubai. So yes. that, and you mentioned about... Um, China, I think the similar mentality like that also in India. Um, one of my US friends and entrepreneurs was saying that if you fail, they wear it with a badge that I have failed, I have taken a risk. I'm, I'm better than you because I've at least tried. And uh, but in India, they are like, you. I told you you shouldn't have tried. Now you have failed. Now you won't go anywhere. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that, it's a, we, we have to learn, you know, that uh, entrepreneurship just like life to some degree is a bit of like a game you know you have to be uh, willing to lose from time to time to fail from time to time to eventually become proficient and 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 reach success and it's completely fine you know? nobody expects if you're playing a video game or a football match or a poker game nobody expects that you're going to win every single hand or every single match that's ridiculous right but the, but actually whilst failing you're learning and then eventually you can become the champion right and entrepreneurship is Absolutely. a lot like that as well so if the incentives are uh, wrong and they penalize failure and of course failure has nothing to do with uh, uh, defrauding or uh, that, that's completely off uh, unacceptable but failure just to you know, you try to build something and it doesn't catch and you, and you and you have to fold and start over again. That's the way that's the way it works. You know, it's very organic. It's like it's the way nature works. So, um, you know, it, it, that's good. You know, emulating nature is actually great. You know, so we should Absolutely. learn to do that more. And talking about India and startups, it's time to ask for OLX. You know, it's <laughs> such a well-known brand. Everybody in India knows OLX, OLX, Beige <laughs> Day, like the ad. And um, it is surprising. I was talking to my dad in the morning. I said, uh, the founder of OLX is coming. And he was like, 
Hey, he couldn't believe that it is somebody outside India. That too in Argentina. <laughs> that that too Argentine for that matter. That's uh, so it's that's, so so well knit in India. Yes, yes, it's uh, it has happened to me. Uh, it was very funny that the first time I went to India, I was talking with a person in immigration, and said, "What what do you do?" And I said, "Well, I founded OLX." And uh, I said, "You founded OLX." How come you founded OLX if OLX is Indian? And uh, we had a we had a fun conversation. And yeah, um, I think I'm very proud that we were able to create a company that is so um, so Indian that people think that it was 100% born there. And it, to some way, it was because the Indian version of OLX was, of course, built to a large degree um, by Indians because it was catered to India. But but yeah, the truth is. Uh, the code was written, the initial code uh, was written in, in Buenos Aires in Argentina, just like the, uh, the code for OLX in Eastern Europe or Brazil, everywhere, right? Um, it, it was, uh, I, I felt so proud, you know, that when, when, we, when we took off in India, because um, I, I, we, we didn't think that it was going to be possible, you know, India being so big and... Uh, so far away in 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 in, in many dimensions, uh, we thought this is going to be impossible, and uh, and we were very. I think we, the timing was perfect um, because there was a need there, and and we were able to communicate it clearly. Um, like always, you know, we 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 had some luck, and also we had some great people. Um, the the first uh, employee in India who was also. Uh, the CEO, the first CEO of OLX India, um, my great friend uh, Amartit Batra, uh, you know, he had uh, a lot to do with that success as well. Uh, he he was, um, uh, you know, he was spectacular. And uh, well, you know, once OLX had taken off and, uh, you know, the, we had millions of users, um, uh, still he was to some degree, uh, managing the whole company from either from his home, which was at that point not typical. After the pandemic, a lot more typical, but back then it was not typical at all. And he was managing it from there and with a very, very small team, one or two people for quite some time. And But everybody thought that this was a huge corporation, you know, uh, and 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 he, he did it all because he was uh, so so smart and so committed um, and also so simple in the good sense, you know, he understood what was fundamental and, and he did it, you know, and uh, with, a, with a big, big smile and working a lot uh, and, and together, of course, with the team in, in Buenos Aires and team in New York um, and myself and my co-founder uh, Fabrice Grinda, um, he did it and we did it, you know, and uh, it was fantastic. I'll never you know, forget uh, the first time I went there and just random people, uh, random people uh, go to a restaurant and ask the waiter, you know, and the waiter, of course, of course, oh, Alex, uh, I've used it. Uh, very nice, you know, very nice. So when you started, it's great to know uh, Amrajit, Mr. Amrajit Batra's story. But when you started OLX, what was your vision? What was the problem that you're trying to solve? Yes. Well, we started um, OLX with the idea <clears throat> of uh, creating um, a used goods marketplace for the emerging world. So, and um, one, the first challenge we had was to realize um, where to focus, right? So we had to think um, the world is a, is, 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 is a big place with hundreds of, of countries. No? So um, we decided to think like a Martian. Okay, so if you're a Martian, you know, a, a person from Mars, from the planet Mars, and you land on Earth and you are told, um, you know, you have to start somewhere, where do you start? And so why did we do this? Because it was a way to be objective, right? To be not based on preferences, or legacy, but just to be 100% objective. So um, as a Martian, we prioritize countries based on 
potential size um, uh, competitive dynamics um, launch costs etc and well long story short relatively quickly the BRICS Brazil Russia India and China uh, came up at the top because they were all large countries they were relatively low competition um, and and it was a moment you know this was 2005 it's a, you know some, some time ago 2005 six seven eight those years um, back then uh, the world was going to be eaten up by the bricks everything was in, in lots of investment was coming uh, the countries were there was a lot of enthusiasm there and as I said low competitive scenario so we launched those were the first places we launched in India Brazil Russia and China uh, and then it was different they're so big these countries and so um, so so it, it, so different, big and so different, that we had different strategies for each one. So um, in, uh, in the case of China, we actually launched acquiring uh, Ideng, an existing small platform, and pushed it forward. Uh, in the case of India, we launched uh, Greenfield. Uh, in the case of Brazil, we launched Greenfield, but we also eventually merged with a competitor 50-50 and became uh, uh, you know, uh, the joint venture between OLX and uh, Bomb Negocio, the competitor. And in Russia, we launched uh, and eventually were um, uh, merged into the, the number one player, but they were bigger than us. So we became minority shareholders in, in that joint venture. So we had all kinds of combinations, 50-50 joint venture in Brazil, minority joint venture in Russia. We actually acquired a company in China and a Greenfield launch in India. In India. So, we, so in all we, these countries, yes. As you're talking about strategy in different countries, I wanted to ask you what fundamental differences or what visible differences have you seen in the markets of these different countries? You are from a perspective of a founder who is trying to do business in BRICS and all other countries in the world. Yes. I'm going to tell you about some things we realize are very different, but also some amazing similarities. Um, you know, if one thinks of India and China and Brazil and Russia and then Argentina and the US and France, one would imagine that there's an immense differences in terms of uh, the user behavior. And we were surprised to find very similar user behaviors. Um, People, you know, want to buy uh, more or less the same types of goods. Um, they all care about similar things. You know, they care about uh, price if you're buying used goods and they want to buy, um, you know, safely something and they care about, you know, how you get to deliver the good and you react to messages from the platform in different ways. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it's very similar um, user behavior, but very different um, competitive dynamics and very different um, uh, infrastructure in each country. So, um, it, for example, in, in some countries, the advertising uh, ecosystem uh, was very different from others. So you ha we had to use television. In some other countries, we only used, so, sorry, some we used air television in some we used cable television. In some others, we used offline stuff. Like can you billboard. name? Can you name name the countries? Yes. In well, which example, you did what? Yes. Um, okay. So in China, it was there was a lot of online. Every country had a mix, right? But just to the focus, a lot of online. Um, in India, we had a mix. So there were there was a lot of offline. There was a television we did a lot of television in india um, in uh, in the us there was a cable television um, it, in russia uh, there were social networks mostly um, in brazil it was cable television as well um, it, it, it was it was different right and uh, and the prices were very different for example and that that drove to some degree the mix um, in some places, um, doing 
for example, the online advertising using uh, the big players it was very expensive. In others, using the same companies, but in a different market, it was a lot cheaper. So it, what, what we tried to do in each one of the markets was um, very quickly understand um, how to optimize our marketing investment, right? So how to understand where, it, which, which mix of advertising was conducive to uh, better users who used more frequently our um, solutions, our uh, website initially, our app afterwards, and, and, and who generated lawyer users with high retention, right? Um, and and that, that varied. But, but once they were there, and once you had the users, they reacted very similarly to our uh, stimulus, uh, to uh, whatever, whatever it was, to an email campaign, or a notifications campaign, or a change, a change mm. in, uh, in the communication on the website or on the app or change, all the different things you do to optimize behavior, you know, changing text and colors, mm. uh, adding a new functionality. That normally uh, worked very, very similarly across, across countries. It's interesting. I think that to some degree- You did a- um, we, We're very similar. Did you do a mark? Mm -hmm. We're very similar, but we operate in, 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 in within structures that are very different. So the structures above the people are very different, but the people are, are a lot more similar than one would imagine. Th that would be my conclusion. So, Sorry, your thing. An entrepreneur trying to do business in multiple countries, how did you find or come to de these decisions of what color to choose or what language or text or mediums? Did you do a market survey or was it by trial and experiment or did you just Google for the answers? <laughs> <laughs> the, the initial one, of course, is a combination of just our own preferences and some, you know, yeah, some basic benchmarking, right? That's the initial one. But after that, it's a lot of trial and error. A lot of trial and error. We would uh, test, 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 and whatever worked, we do more of that. And whatever didn't work, you know, we discard it. Now, <laughs> building a platform that that works well, you know, in in in, in these test testing environments, is not very easy. But but developing that flexibility to be able to very quickly learn from the audience and then um, include incorporate that feedback into the new product development process and very quickly adjust. I think is a key to success, a very important key to success. Um, and uh, yeah, I think eventually we did it quite well. At the beginning, we're a bit stiff. Uh, normally, it's interesting. Normally, um, very, very frequently, uh, what we thought would work best was not what people like best, you know. Uh, so uh, I think it's more important to have a, an open mind and to be able to listen to the audience, to the users, uh, very closely than it is to have quote unquote gurus and experts, you know, because gurus and experts very often do not represent uh, very well the demographics, particularly in large countries like these, like uh, India, Brazil, India, uh, Russia, China. They're, um, um, you know, uh, experts are very unique, you know, they're not representative very often and they're, they're wrong very often. You know? That's a very great insight. Thank you for that. Before going to the next question, I want to share a personal note about using OLX. I was uh, shifting from my like from an old house to new house and many goods I had to sell online and it was such a good experience. It was so convenient, people coming and taking you, posting ad. So it, it is an amazing thing that you're doing. And I believe that it is so such a good fit for Indian market because Indians use the product till it has the last value. Suppose a cloth is there, what I'm wearing right now is a cloth I buy. It'll be worn till it gets torn. And then after it's torn, it'll be used like a uh, sweeping mob. <laughs> and then it'll be, then it won't remain till that time. So <laughs> keeping the value till the last end and even after finding value, even in the goods 
you used that was like an amazing thing something which is which won't va- have value that you can now sell and even make uh, money out of that so thank you an amazing uh, product there next questions i want to ask about art you are on the board of uh, museum of modern art you have a you have been running a museum there art 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 ba what is your process of collecting artworks <laughs> yes i see uh, art as a as a very nice balance um between my activity you know as a tech entrepreneur and 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 my life in general because as a tech entrepreneur and a ceo um you know i've been very often required to provide answers uh, you know to give direction whereas in art my connection with art uh, it gener- the art generates questions to me so it's not answers it's questions um and i'm i'm more passive you know as a ceo i'm very active and pushing ideas and uh, leading people uh, in my connection with art i'm contemplating you know i'm passing i'm receiving so it's 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 a balance you know between if for my life very very important um and <laughs> in that sense what i've been trying to do is uh, is build a collection of um contemporary artists but it's a collection that has a few um guiding principles that are not very standard um first i um I like to see myself as uh, somebody who supports uh, art the art scene rather than collects art pieces for personal enjoyment it's I, I support the art scene so since I'm supporting the art scene uh the art that we collect is art coming from artists that are alive that's a big distinction we don't buy uh, except for, there's a few very small exceptions but 98% or 99% of the art we buy comes from um living artists because that way when we buy the art we're actually funding the production of culture for the future whereas if i buy um you know a piece from an artist that isn't here anymore whatever whomever picasso whatever uh, that you know that may, might be very nice but it's not helping develop more culture you know it's just giving money to uh another collector or a an auction house or a gallery so living artist um and uh, always in the pr- primary market never secondary market so even though with OLX and Remat etc my focus was secondary market used goods with art it's always primary market it's straight to the uh creator uh, to the to the artist through the gallery but to the artist never buy art from a dealer or from a an auction house or from another collector where the money does not go to the artist okay because then i'm not supporting the art scene you know um, another thing that we uh, try to do is to focus on what's happening today today so the focus is art created after the 20 so in in the 21st century after the year 2000 <clears throat> so that way um we know that we are interacting with the art of today uh, the exactly the very current uh, you know uh, art today and and that's i think very very nice you know so um those are some of the things and then i like to promote the art of my country which is argentina so um i'm in the board for example of the museum of modern art of new york the board for latin america which is called the latin american and caribbean a fund of the museum of modern art in new york and my one of my roles there is to actually promote argentinian art so that i've actually already donated a, a few works that that then are exhibited there and so people from all over the world can see these these works and we also participate in the selection of works that are um recommended by curators and again by by choosing some of this art we we are making that art visible to to the to the rest of the planet not only people in argentina it, 
with Arteba, Arteba, uh, that's a contemporary art fair, and I was a uh, president for three, three, two year terms, and also a board member for another like eight or 10 years. So very much involved there. And I tried to also develop, um, uh, you know, a habit uh, of people uh, buying art, just normal people, not people who, uh, you know, take this very, very seriously, like collectors, etc. just anybody can buy a, a piece of art. So pushing art through that art fair, uh, in order to have multiple people uh, getting engaged with art. I think that was a, a big, big adventure as well. And I'm very happy because right now that I'm living in Brazil, although I'm from Argentina, but I'm living in Brazil, in uh, Rio de Janeiro. Um, my collection has been invited to participate in, 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 a, in a number of museums in the Contemporary Art Museum in Rio de Janeiro last year. And uh, the Instituto Tomio Take, which is a very good contemporary museum, art museum in Sao Paulo this year. So the collection is coming and the artists in the collection will be exhibited so that people can know them. No, it's a, it's a, it, it's, it's a very cool adventure. This one of getting involved with supporting a artist, you know, I like it very much. That is amazing. I got to give you salute for that, for supporting living artist and the your approach for collecting because i am a nft artist myself and this has been a common discussion and uh why people have adopted nfts that they the living artist can fund their dream or passion for creating art and you're a big support in that so my next question is how do you discover the artist do they apply like in like in your startup um, uh, funds or do you stumble upon them in museums or some other process that only you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a bunch of of ways. Um, there's gallery openings. Um, there's art fairs. Um, there's um, there's multiple ways. There's just the the artist sending us the information, but also I have a a team in, 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 for this activity. So. Uh, there's an art curator. Uh, right now, the curator of the collection lives in Madrid, in Spain. His name is Mariano Meyer. And he is exposed to art in uh, many places. And um, through that, uh, you know, through, through his connections, we receive a lot of um, opportunities. Um, but we also visit a lot of art fairs and visit art studios, etc. So it's kind of all of the above. Um, but then once we receive them, um, the curator basically, uh, with, with the team, uh, decides on whether to buy or not based on what they believe is to be the importance of the art being, um, you know, assessed and the, um, the artist as well. So, uh, it's complicated because there's a lot more, uh, you know, <laughs> out there than we can actually buy. We have a limited budget, of course, um, but we've, um, we, we're happy with what we built. The collection today is 550 plus works. Um, and it's very, it's a very, um, um, horizontal, um, collection, meaning that lots of artists, a hundred and almost 150 artists in the collection. Uh, and that's, that's spectacular because, um, we, we have all the different formats. We have installations, videos, um, photography, um, we have paintings, uh, we have uh, performances, um, we have all the different formats. And, um, and we have, uh, I think, a, a clear representation of what's going on in contemporary art in, in, in this market today, because it's so open, right? 150 artists. I think that 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 represents it's 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 not perfect of course but i think it represents quite well what's going on right now amazing how can the viewers reach the curators how can what sorry how can the artist watching this episode uh, yeah. reach your curators yes um well um <laughs> if you search online uh the Oxenford Collection or Collection Oxenford 
you, 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 you find it very quickly. Um, Mariano Meyer, he's very well known. And so in, if, if you operate in these circles, it would be very, you, you'd know of Mariano. It's a, he's a very well known person in, 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 in Argentine contemporary art. So it would be very easy for people to be able to connect with him. Um, he's a bit of a celebrity. Um, and um, uh, yeah, also myself, you know, it's not hard to, to get in touch with us. <laughs> Amazing. Who is your favorite artist? <laughs> That's a question I cannot answer because I would have a one happy artist and 149 <laughs> annoyed artists. But uh, uh, I, I can tell you what I like in artists, you know. Uh, I like it when they are... No, irreverent. you got to. You got to. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, you want to be, I'm putting you on a spotlight. So whichever the first name comes to your mind, people will understand. Which is the okay, first I, name I, coming to your mind? I, 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 then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about an artist, but not artists in my collection. Because, but an artist <laughs> I, really, I really like is um, uh, Picasso. I think Picasso. Why Picasso? Uh, why Picasso? The other would be um, Da Vinci. I think Da Vinci and Picasso would be the two artists in history that, 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 that I'm, you know, I like the most. And, and for similar reasons. Uh, both of them were very disruptive. They created um, artistic movements. They changed the way art was perceived. Um, they, they were very strong personalities that uh, influenced um, their whole era, you know. Um, and, and even today, you know, we continue discovering um, all the fantastic things they did, right? So, yeah, I think that Da Vinci and, and, and Picasso, the two artists that I'm most, most impressive for me. And what I like of contemporary artists, that artists that are, are alive today, is that when they, when they play, when they can be, when they can do something that nobody else is doing, they use a material that is not typical, they use a form that is not typical. Um, they send a message or a narrative that is not mainstream. Um, I like that very much, you know. Uh, I, I, I like it when they are, um, you know, they, they can uh, enjoy what they're doing in a way that uh, we, people participating with them can also enjoy uh, what they're doing. You know? I like humor in art. I like beauty. I also I'm, I understand sometimes art needs to be, um, you know, convey, uh, uh, you know, uh, difficult uh, emotions, etc. It doesn't need to be beautiful, but but I like beautiful. I like I like color very much, uh, and I like I like creativity. I love creativity and sensitivity. The, 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 when the artist can actually convey an idea, a concept, in a in a creative way, I like that very much. Amazing. You dodged that bullet very well. <laughs> Second question is, you can answer any one of these questions. Which is your favorite artwork? Or you can answer, which is the recently collected artwork? <laughs> My favorite artwork. Um, okay, one of my favorite artworks uh, is... Uh, yeah, it's it's a map by an artist called Guillermo Cuitca, and I I love it. It's 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 got many things that make it very special. Um, first of all, it's 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 very big. It's uh, and it's vertical, which is unusual. You know, paintings normally are horizontal. This one is vertical. It's more than three meters tall, three meters and five centimeters tall. So very 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 large. It doesn't fit in a normal space it's um i love the color it's blue very 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 deep blue and uh and it's a map where every city and every town on the map it's a very big map with hundreds of small cities and and roads and towns they're all in the wrong place the wrong they're all misplaced so it's a map to get lost <laughs> now the idea of of uh you know, enjoying a map and having a map to get lost. I love it. You know, it's a, in, in, in a world where we are controlled, you know, by our watch and the calendar and the schedules and the regulations 
and the laws <laughs> and, pol and what's politically correct and what we should do and we should we're all regulated by all kinds of um, influences and uh, pushed to be in a certain way the idea that, that a map you know will only get you lost if you follow it but it's still there I find it fascinating no? the other thing I like very much besides the size and and this idea of a map to get lost um, it, it is the fact that there's a very cool name it's called everything so as a collector you know uh, I think that now that I have that map if I ever decide to stop collecting I shouldn't worry because I already have everything you know so <laughs> so, so that's that's nice as well you know uh, for those reasons I love, I love very much and the and the artist is also a, He's a, he's a very special person. He's devoted a big part of his life to helping other younger artists develop. And uh, he, there's a big um, grant called uh, the Quitka Grant, so his name and grant, which, which you know, he, awards, he awarded prizes for a long time to uh, young, younger artists and taught them. He's a, he's a, he's a very positive influence uh, on the art scene. Life as an artist is with a lot of struggles and uncertainty, lots of patience and uh, famine and festival also sometimes. What is one advice you would give the artist? Like we have a big artist community who watches this. Yes. Um, I think one advice I would give them is to, you know, Sometimes it's a bit tempting to be commercial, to go with a trend, because then it's easier to sell your art. Uh, so if you just follow the, the existing currents of what the markets require, uh, you know, it's just easier to make money. And I understand that, you know, for artists need to live from what they produce and, and therefore the commercial aspect is important. But I also think that there should be a balance and they should be very, very, creative and disruptive and completely uh, from time to time forget about the influences of the system, the art system and the markets and, and just do what they really think best represents themselves and their views. Because to a large degree, um, the best contribution that any artist can uh, create is the essence of what they are. So to the degree that they adjust to what others expect, they're not providing the essence of what they are. And that's what the rest will eventually profit most from. You see, if I'm a, 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 like, like many artists are, you know, a mini genius, and I have this vision, which is fantastic, and this contribution, which will slightly change reality and change the world, but instead of representing those ideas which which are myself and it's my essence i go with you know what the market wants um, then everybody is left without uh, without that work that would have been uh, so revealing no? so uh, yeah one 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 um, recommendation i would give them which is which is you have to, to be careful because artists need to make money and they need to live but is to to really focus on um, being honest with themselves and being uh, genuine and uh, doing what they really believe and expressing what they really believe, uh, you know, is important. Um, and also the other thing I would, I would mention is that, you know, they're choosing a, a very different path in life. You know, it's a lot easier to be a bank teller uh, or, or to work in a company than it is to be an artist. Um, but it's also a lot more gratifying um, from time to time, you know, so they have to develop a, a, a big inner life to be able to live uh, those high excitements that when they have a big opening and they, you know, they're praised by what they do and their creative activity is so fulfilling, it's so spectacular, but at the same time, they have to develop interior life to be able to um, uh, live through all those deserts between the good times. Uh, where they might not be able to sell anything, the shows don't come up, etc. And 
and you know, and that's the life of an artist. It's unpredictable. Um, it, there, it, there will be ups and downs all the time. It will not be like this. It will be like this. And, uh, and, and you have to be ready for that because it can be, you know, it can be onerous if you're not. Um, so to invest also in your inner life, I think is a, is a big, an important recommendation, you know? And the last one would be, um, you know, artists are very, very sensitive people. They, I think they, they can feel the essence of what's going on. Um, eh, sometimes before the rest of society, you know, yeah, that's very important. Yeah, so um, connect with that. I would recommend that they really connect with that and focus on uh, reflecting so that all of us, the rest of us, can understand better our world through what they, what they, what, what they can do. You know? So I learn a lot from artists, you know, and often uh, visions that are very different from, from my own. Beautiful. To all those Howard School professors watching this, please bring a case study of an artist <laughs> next <laughs> class. Let's talk about Argentina next. Vamos, let's go. Um, what do you love the most about your country? I think the people. People are warm. Um, it, it's, it's a warm place. People are open, they are very candid, they, they're warm, they like um, spending time with other people, they, 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 they honestly care about others, you know, and uh, it's, it's a very pleasant place, you know, the relationships are warm, families are close, um, you know, it's, there's a lot of social capital, I would say. Yeah, in in Argentina, which which you can feel, other other cultures are a lot colder. You know, like uh, um, people. You know, for example, um, it's very very typical that every Sunday uh, you would have a a family meeting in, in in Argentina. People and the different generations would all meet and have fun and spend it and enjoy it. You know. In many cultures, that's not possible. You know? So, uh, friendships, friendships from, you know, kindergarten or from high school typically last all all the life. You know, and uh, and people care. You know, and uh, they will help you if you are in trouble, and they would be around. So that's something I like very much. You know, you you feel it very quickly. It's a uh, it's a warm place. Wow. If there is one thing you could change about your country, what would that be? <laughs> the politicians. <laughs> Sorry? The politician, politicians, the politicians. Politicians are, you know, we have a very corrupt base of politicians. Um, and unfortunately, they, I don't think they represent very well the people. They represent themselves a lot more. And yeah, and that's a big problem. Yeah, I mean, when we talk about inflation and over excess of money printing, Argentina is always an example in that. So did you did you live through that moment or how do people talk about it in, in Argentina? Yeah, it's a, it's, 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 a, it's a very complicated situation. And, you know, Argentina is the only country in the world that was uh, developed using, you know, the uh, international statistics in terms of um, literacy, healthcare, um, uh, you know, income, uh, you know, per capita, and all of that. It was developed and then became underdeveloped. So it, it was underdeveloped. It raised to the development phase and then became underdeveloped again. It's the only country, no other country, it usually. It's only one way, you know, countries are not developed and then eventually they become more and more developed and then they join the rich countries. We are the only one who did it the other way around. So we have a problem there, right? And a lot of it has to do with being irresponsible fiscally. Um, so spending more than, than we have as a country and that causing a lot of inflation. 
So we've had uh, lots of fiscal crisis and inflationary crisis um, in the last, yeah, since the 1930s already. So like you know, almost a hundred years. Um, it's, it's, it's sad because it looks like, like we are always um, falling <laughs> in the same trap. You know, it's like kind of, we have this incapacity to learn from our mistakes as a society. And that's, that's problematic here. Is the overspending issue a common thing with, with the normal people also, or is it just a government politician thing, a macro thing? I think it's mostly a government thing. It's a macro thing. Uh, actually, um, private sector uh, loans, for example, are very low because all of the capital in the country goes to, to finance government loans. <laughs> so uh, if you look at credit card loans, if you look at mortgages, um, eh, extremely low, extremely low, like a, like a third or a fourth the size of Chile, which is our neighboring country to the left, or Brazil, our neighboring country to the right, so to, to the west, to the east. Um, the the uh, no, the, the, the private sector is a lot more um, judicious than government. Um, yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, the government is the way it is. Not unfortunately, I think the the government could learn a lot from from the people. Yeah. Uh, there is another infamous fact about Argentina. When we look at the World War II history, there were many countries that supported Nazi Germany before, during, and Argentina was the only one which supported after the World War to the Nazis. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I found it funny. It's a bit of a controversial issue. Um, there's different uh, versions of that. Um, Yes, some Nazis came here after the Second World War. They also went to many countries there. Yeah? They went to Spain a lot. Some went to Switzerland, actually. Some even went to the U.S., actually, with uh, and paid for that because they became scientists there. Et some of them. So they went to many places. But yes, there was a, um, a government uh, led by a person called Perón, who was a sympathizer of Mussolini and uh, Hitler, and he actually welcomed some of the some of the Nazis. So that's a very bad thing that happened in the country. But let me tell you something else, which is also the case. <clears throat> Do you know which is the country in the world, the city, the city in the world, where you have more like a larger Jewish population outside of Israel? If you take out New York, so except for New York, the second city with the most large population of Jewish people outside of Israel is Buenos Aires. It's oh, the wow. largest I didn't Jewish know that. community on the planet. So, so you, can tell, you can see again, it's the same recurring theme. You have a government that does stupid things, but it, they, they do these things behind the people. It's not hmm. that the people were all very happy to, to support the Nazis. It's just the government that did this. But then you go to the people, and it's a very welcoming people, as I said, huge. You have a enormous uh, Jewish population in the whole city. We have a huge, specifically Jewish neighborhood, but the Jewish population lives all over the place. And uh, you'd, you, for my school, for example, I would say 20% of my fellow students uh, were Jewish. Um, many of my mm. friends are Jewish, partners, etc. It's very common. There's no, mm. no zero discrimination, you know? There's no issue. And and, uh... That's an interesting uh, fact about Buenos Aires. You know, one next question I wanted to ask about festivals. Every country and every community has their own festivals. Which is your favorite festival from Argentina? Yeah. Um, well, one, one festival which I like very much is the Art Week. Um, so it's a week where art, the Art of Affair happens, but also... Um, all the museums and the galleries in the country open in special hours all the way to the middle of the night. And, and there's actually exhibitions on the streets, etc. So uh, the, the, whole, the whole city becomes very vibrant and uh, there's art everywhere. And I, I like it. I like that very much. There's also some um, film exhibitions and music exhibitions and even a carnival like, like they have in, in Brazil, in, in Rio de Janeiro. 
there's a in a place called Walewachu in the north of um, the, of the province of Buenos Aires, and uh, you know you cross over to the next province and, and there, and uh, it, you know there's a there's like a carnival with the chariots and uh, and the costumes and all of that. So there's 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 diff- there's, a, there's also a wine festival in Mendoza, which is the wine region. Uh, it was very popular and very high quality. Uh, and so people would go there and experience and taste all the wines uh, of Argentina. Malbec is, uh, is, is a particularly good Argentinian uh, wine type. Um, and, and in Mendoza, you have really, really good uh, wine. Argentina is one of the main exporters of wine in, in the whole world. Wow. What is one unique wedding ritual in Argentina, unique what? Sorry, wedding, marriage, yeah, yeah, wedding yeah, yeah. ritual. <laughs> well, we are a bit conservative. I, 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 conservative in that sense. I don't think there's a lot of peculiarities of, you know, um, one thing that that is used to be quite common today is a bit less common, which is that people used to ask, uh, you know, for their spouses. Uh, father's permission to get married, um, but um, yeah, th- there's two weddings normally. There's a, a what we call a civil wedding, which happens in a in a government office. That's required if you are getting married. And then, depending on which is your religion, there's a religious wedding as well, uh, normally. And there's a typically a party depending on, you know, people have big parties and people have smaller parties. But I suspect that weddings in India are more fun. <laughs> I think they, they, they last longer. I was invited to a, a, an Indian wedding. I couldn't go, unfortunately. But it lasted three days, you know, and it had a, all kinds of events and different... You had to wear different clothes that each day. That doesn't. That's not the case here, you know. So we, I think we're a lot it's, less fun and less creative when it comes to wedding weddings in Argentina. It's true. It's true when people say big fat Indian wedding, and there's <laughs> another fact about Indian weddings is uh, in in US people and parents usually worry about saving funds for college of the students, right? I want to save funds for the college of my children, but in India. Fathers save money for the marriage. So they, they say that the money they have saved is for the marriage. Or when you have to give emphasize how important that saving is, I have spent the money from what I had saved for the marriage. That's what they say here. So, <laughs> so nice. I, I, like that. I like that. Very nice. Yes. What is the best local food? Well, Argentina is mostly uh, well known for, for beef. So all, all, all types of all types of meat, yeah. but again, wine is becoming increasingly, uh, it's very, very popular. P- people have a lot of wine and Malbec in particular. And given the Italian influence, I think that uh, pasta, uh, pizza and ice cream are very, very good quality here as well. I, I actually like Argentinian ice cream more than any other ice cream uh, I've ever tasted. And, and there's ice cream shops almost, you know, in every corner, like very, every two or three blocks. There's an, in, f- from my apartment here, I can see three ice cream shops, you know, like uh, it's, it's something very, very typical. And, uh, and also having uh, pizza is very, very common. Everybody has pizza uh, several times a month. You know? So, but beef would be the, 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 the most common uh, food in, in Argentina. I love ice creams and I would I think I'll have a good time there. Talking about activities, what is the most fun activity to do in Argentina? <laughs> There's multiple things to be done, but for example, um if you like uh, to dance and to see something very uh, folklore, um I would I I would I would participate in a tango dance. Tango is something very, oh, yes. very special and very nice. Um, then I would also go. I would involve something. I, I would be involved in in some activity with horses. Argentinian horses are. There's a lot of horses here. For example, 
Polo is very big. Um, there's, it's one of the very few countries and cities where the, there's a polo field in the mid, two polo fields in the middle of, of the city, you know, in, the, the, in a highly de dense urban place, two huge polo fields. And the, the polo championship is the biggest in, in, in the world. So, and there's two hippodromes in the city, also in the middle of the city, you know, big, big uh, hippodromes. So God, what is a hippodrome? Hypodrome is where the horse races, you know. Okay. So the horse races, and 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 there's a vast lands, as 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 we mentioned, you know. There's a big territory, but uh, with very little population. So it's very lots of empty land, and uh, normally people move around in horses. You know, they go from mm. they just uh, you know, and so um, going to for the weekend to an estancia, which is like a farm. And going horseback riding, something very special, and uh, and that can be done, I think, as, as a tourist. Also, um, wow. in terms of traveling around, there's some very special places because if you go to the north, you can go to the Iguazu Falls. It's uh, the largest fall on the planet in terms of um, uh, size of the of the fall, um, the, the the breadth of the fall, and it, it's it's in the corner of three countries, Brazil. Paraguay and Argentina, the three countries, that, that corner where the three countries meet is this huge fall, uh, the waterfall. Visiting it is very spectacular. And then down south, we have glaciers, very, very big glaciers like Perito Moreno and others, also very spectacular, Patagonia. There's a, a lot of nature to be seen. I think people come to Argentina, you, you can do two things. You enjoy the city of Buenos Aires for the culture and the tango and the coffee shops and the restaurants and the museums and the parks. Then you go to the wine country, the Mendoza, and then it's natural, um, you know, being exposed to nature. You know, you go see the, the whales in the coast or the, as I said, Iguazu Falls or the Patagonia and, uh, and the um, um, glaciers uh, or the, the, the lakes and the lake region. It's, it's, the natural wonders are very spectacular. You know, you mentioned Mendoza. It's a pretty common Christian surname in India, especially for the Catholics. So you can you can identify. Okay, these are Catholic Catholics. Next question is: For a moment, can you close your eyes? Think of your favorite memory, and describe that to us in your own language. I open my eyes or not? Yeah, you can open. Yes. No, I was thinking my 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 mother has uh, has got own language, and then wow. we'll translate it. Yeah. It's, I said in Spanish. This is. Yeah. Okay. Eh, me estoy acordando de eh, un momento con mi mamá cuando ella me contaba cuentos cuando yo era chiquito. <laughs> Amazing! It's it's really nice to hear the words and uh, syllables from the from new languages. So what what did you say? It was I think it was about your mother. Yes, my, my mother uh, she 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 she's gone, and I was just remembering a moment when I was a, a kid and I was with her and she was telling me stories. You know, so it was a nice moment. Very very caring and uh, we're both smiling a lot. You know. In a very with a very good energy, you know, like a like a protected and nice and having fun. Yeah. What was your favorite dish cooked by your mother? <laughs> Scrambled eggs. <laughs> she was not a great cook. She, <laughs> she, <laughs> but, uh, but but the scrambled eggs were very good. Yes. Okay. And the story you mentioned, you enjoyed listening stories from her. Do you recall any favorite story of yours? Yes, she had, um, there's a story about, uh, she invented um, uh, characters. And this were um, two mice, you know, two small mouse called Fricks and Frogs. And they were adventurous 
mice, you know, freaks and frogs. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Wow. All right. What are some other less known facts? I think we have covered a lot of them, but still, if you want to add something to for people to come and see Argentina or something that world should know about Argentina, you can share that now. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Well, there's a lot of wildlife in Argentina, like just like India, you know, you have lions and tigers and all kinds of animals. We have uh, guanacos and jaguars um, and llamas, you know. We don't have the big, uh, the, we don't have elephants and tigers and, <coughs> and lions, but we do have smaller, smaller animals, no? Mm. We have, um, let's see, um, as I mentioned, we have the largest, the tallest mountain in the Western Hemisphere called Aconcagua, a very, very high mountain, very dangerous to climb. People from over, all over the world come and some, some don't make it because it's very dangerous, but very, very beautiful. Uh, and we have Buenos Aires as the, the world's widest avenue uh, in widest. the whole world. A, a, 18 lanes long, uh, wide, the, the avenue. It's called Nueve de Julio. Very, very, oh, wow. very, very wide avenue, which crosses the middle of the city. Um, uh, I think I read about this. People, it is so big that there are some public holidays when they close down the road and all everybody comes on the road and plays football. <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it's amazingly, amazingly long. And then... Um, what else? Um, yeah, well, you, I think you, we have we, talked we, about. Yeah, we 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 have produced uh, some of the best uh, football players. You talk talk about Messi and Maradona, uh, and we're very very proud about uh, football. Mm. You know, and it, Do being you like a, playing football. <laughs> no, no, not not really. But my son is a he loves playing football. Yeah, not not me really. <laughs> uh huh. So now to the signature round, the suspenseful you wanted to know. (laughs) Let's get to that. First question. Name three people, living or dead, that you'd like to have lunch with. Okay. Leonardo da Vinci. Um, That'll be the first one for sure. I think Jesus Christ, I would love to have lunch with Jesus Christ. And um, Einstein. If you had to ask them one question, different question for different people, what question would you ask them? Okay. So... So to Einstein, I would ask, um, <laughs> I would ask him to tell me, to, to give me life advice. I would ask him to, to tell me, um, based on his experience uh, and the way I am, just to give me life advice. I would just love to hear from him. Um, to Jesus, I would ask him uh, about the afterlife. <laughs> and to Leonardo da Vinci, I would ask him about creativity, you know, and uh, how to be more creative. Amazing. If today was the last day you lived, what would you do? I would spend time with my loved ones, I think, um, and uh, hopefully laugh a lot uh, and just uh, walk, walk in the park, um, tell people that I love them and hopefully hear from them that they love me, you know, just uh, simple things. Yes. What do you want to be remembered for?
Hmm. A few things I would like to be remembered for. Um, for having been a positive influence in those around me, my loved ones, family, friends, uh, for having created a sustainable um, institutions, companies, you know, th things that are uh, that continue to have a, 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 a good impact on society after I'm gone. And for my uh, my art collection, you know, like uh, uh, having built something that reflects my generation of of art and hence culture of my time in a in in a, in a good way having built a, a, a you know a, an archive that really helps people in the future understand better what it was to be alive at this time wow what does art mean for you Art, I mean, for me, art is that intersection between the material and the divine, you know, it's a, uh, it's creation. And that's why it's divine, but also because it's human, it's material. So it's that connection uh, between us and the, and the divine. Yeah. What does art do for the world? or society per se? It shows us um, things that we cannot see um, at first sight. You know, it, it shows us, it educates us, it makes us feel things that are, um, you know, not possible to see or feel um, without art. It just opens our eyes um, and provides beauty and uh, emotions and content and refreshment to our souls. Yeah. How to make money? <laughs> How to make money? Uh, well, I think making money, having fun and doing something that is useful. Um, and learning to create money without um, increasingly with less effort, you know, so that uh, that money uh, doesn't imply you not having any free time. I think because money it was great. I think the perfect situation is that you manage to create to make money <clears throat> and have free time, so that you can actually. <clears throat> invest that money, spend that money, um, and have impact with that money, you know? It's not money for the money's sake. It's money because money is opportunities, it's optionality, it's impact. So uh, create money in a way that it gives you the opportunity to turn around and use that money, you know, in, in, intelligently. But how Once to make it? it? How to make, excuse me? How to make money? How to create the wealth? Ah, <laughs> I, I think it's uh, focusing on uh, a dream that requires money, and and think vis visualize it, and then start moving towards that vision. Uh, I, I don't know. It's like um, I've been asked that question before, and I have some problems explaining it for me it's it's a bit intuitive it's just um, it's uh, <laughs> having a vision and then start moving in that direction and then the universe conspires to help you you know uh, but you have to do that you have to visualize it you know so. thank you what is the most priceless gift you have ever received Yeah, unconditional love, you know, from family, friends, partners, you know, the, that, that feeling that you can count on them, uh, even if you're not worth it, you know, even if you don't deserve it, but 
the, the fact that people, others really love you, uh, that's priceless, very priceless. What is one thing you cannot live without? <laughs> Nature. What is on your bucket list next? I want to visit Sicily. I want to read a few books. Um, and I want to uh, develop a new project, but not as a as a, as a working entrepreneur, more as a smart investor, you know, but to create something. It's a, it's a, I just, I, I don't want to be CEO, but I do want to create something new yet. Another one. <laughs> we'll see. What gets you excited about the future? The adventurous nature of the future, the uncertainty, is the this idea that you know we don't know what lies on the other side of the mountain. You know? So we don't know until we climb the mountain, and then there's something else, and then there's something else, and there's something else. That that life is an adventure, so it just attracts me, you know, to discover it and uh, you know, yeah, participate in this wonderful adventure. You know. What are your views on the metaverse? <laughs> yeah, I think um, we'll see. Uh, on the, I'm not sure whether the metaverse will actually happen like we've been told, but that some that we will be increasingly connected with everybody else and that, um, that actually we are connected with everybody else and in some level we are already one. I firmly believe it. Not sure whether this will happen in a, in a way like we've imagined with small avatars and all. I'm not sure that's going to be the way, but that there is a metaverse and that we will all connect even closer because we are all in some level one. I think that's 100% the case. What do you like to do for fun? <laughs> I like to read. I like to... Uh, Go on a bicycle. Uh, I like to walk on the beach. Uh, I like to go to. I love to go to the cinema. Um, I love love to see um, just a, you know series or uh, films etc. On my on my iPad. I like love to spend time with my friends um, and family etc. Like I love to travel. I love to travel. Um, yeah. I love doing all kinds of things. I like going out for lunches and dinners with others. Yeah. The theater, love theater as well. What is your favorite book? <laughs> Not sure I have a favorite book, but uh, one book that really uh, impacted me is a book by Viktor Frankl called Man in Search of Meaning. Um, very good book, you know, it just taught me that in the end, happiness comes from within. And uh, even in, in, his, in his case, you know, he, had, he was unlucky enough to spend uh, several years in a concentration camp during the Second World War. And even in that most horrendous reality, he managed to be happy. So the point, and he learned and he developed his school of thought of psychological school of thought where he understood that um, hardship and suffering, um, exterior hardship and suffering might be there, but we always in the end have that, um, the last, the final decision, which is what to do with that is ours, you know, and we cannot be externally forced to be in one way or another. So, uh, and, and meaning has a lot to do with that, no? So we're having meaning, is a very important, very, very important. Yeah. I love that book too. I've read it several times. It had helped me in difficult times. 
my main frustration was not finding meaning and yes. it's it said three ways to find meaning one is to experience things one is to uh, create things and the other one is meaning through suffering which he demonstrated in his own life and to other people but as you said at the end of the day happiness comes from within and it's an amazing board everybody should read yes which is your favorite movie star wars <laughs> which part <laughs> the first one <laughs> yes i think it's a on the favorite? one hand, it's a saga it's an epic saga and an adventure a phenomenal adventure but also you know it it just showed us all kinds of new worlds it showed it talked about diversity it talked about you know honesty and being noble and uh, being good and evil and it 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 just showed us how um you know less powerful people can have a positive impact against very powerful enemies sometimes and uh now all kinds of very good messages i really loved star wars i also loved uh, um lord of the rings very much uh, lord of the rings is like there together with the yes <laughs> if you had the power to go in the past or the future where would you go and why possibly ancient greece um Yeah. I'm so curious about how they managed to get such development of in so many dimensions you know in philosophy in uh, um uh, mathematics in um, architecture with with such little resources you know the technology wasn't there but they were so advanced D- democracy you know they came up with this you know it was imperfect but given where they came from it's amazing how democratic uh, society was you know and uh, uh yeah i'm 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 very curious about how they made it work you know i would love to understand more what is your favorite food ice cream Le- lemon ice flavor <laughs> Le- le- lemon chocolate and strawberry i love uh, and wow. uh, yeah and and if that those would be the three favorite lemon and chocolate would be the two favorite and that lemon would be the favorite <laughs> i i've never had lemon cho- lemon ice cream is it with milk or without milk you have both you have both you have oh, sorbet okay. i should i yes. got to come to You should you should check both. Yeah, they're have to come to both. Argentina to try. Yes, they're really special. <laughs> Got to have it. What what inspires you? What makes you tick? I think um yeah, you know, seeing people and i've been very lucky you know to have some fantastic people around me in my life and seeing what people can do um seeing uh, entrepreneurs very high caliber entrepreneurs are around me have been spectacular uh, but also just looking at what people like elon musk is doing you know is changing the world more than governments in many dimensions you know and uh, and he and he has the sky's the limit right the guy wants to go to mars and changing the car industry you know he's he's doing spectacular things and he's an individual just like everybody else you know just proves that it's possible it's possible to to be different i i think i'm a bit of a misfit and i think he's a bit of a misfit so in that dimension at least we are similar but i think he can you know you can learn so much from it's possible to have a lot more impact than we think and i love that Have you collected NFTs? No. <laughs> Why not? Traditional art collector. You are also yes. into Web three, somewhat related to Web three. Yes. Um, 
it, I've always, as, as I said, you know, I've always seen art as a complement to my technological endeavors, right? Not as part of them. Maybe I just see it as a, as, as a different. I, it's, it's when I want to get away from technology, you know, from being a tech entrepreneur, that I get to art. It, it, it's, it's, it's not the same thing. I, 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 I'm not sure I would like to watch a screen, you know, when I'm looking at art. I don't want to watch a screen. I already, I'm looking at a screen now, you know, I'm very often <clears throat> when I look at art, I want to look at a painting or a sculpture or an installation or a performance. I want to touch it and smell it and feel it. And I don't want to look at a screen. You know? um, I'm completely fine with other people looking at the screen, but uh, yeah, it's not for me. You know, when I think about NFTs, it's, it's a contract. Uh, NFT can be a physical art as well. I mean, so, but I get your point that it has to be experienced, not just in the screen, but there are new ways of experiencing also, right? With the, with the head headset and VR and AR experience. What are your views on that? I like music. You know, so, um, and that's for that you need a headset. Um, I would imagine that the new Oculus that will be launched next year will be a big game changer. We'll see. So far, I have not um, been able to use a device which is at the same time um, a game changer, meaning it, it really moves uh, the frontier of how technology helps us perceive and interact in, in, in a better way. And also it being like convenient and not cumbersome and and all the rest. So we'll see. I, I, I expect that Apple, as always, will come up with products that are sensational. We'll see, you know. But so far, I think I have, I mean, I, my, this is, for me, the, the best possible headset, you know, and they're, they're this big. Um, they're 90% as good as, <coughs> as the huge ones and, uh, and they're a lot more convenient. So I don't know. I, I, I think that eventually we will all look a bit like cyborgs and we'll have implants of all types and all kinds of things. But for now, I think it's a bit uh, rudimentary, you know? Um, <laughs> yes. You know, you have this famous quote, I read it in two or three articles, that if you put artists and people from technology world in a room that you won't be able to differentiate. And also yes. you said that both the artist and the people in technology have a very logical mind. So why do you think both are similar? I, I mean, I'll tell what I feel after you say. Yes. Well, uh, there's some traits that I've seen. Um, <clears throat> if you, and I always say this, if you mix 20 in tech engineers and 20 contemporary artists, uh, you know, you wouldn't be able to tell who's who unless you talk to them. Um, it's just the looks, the initial looks. It's usually there are people, both the artists and the engineers, who don't have a lot of, um, they don't care too much about their appearance, you know. They're not cutting edge and uh, fashionable. Uh, they may have, uh, you know, long hair and uh, they, they, they don't care. They don't care too much about their, their image. They care about other things. They care about more important things than their image, you know. In a world where image is everything, you know, in a world where, image is so important. So that already differentiates them very quickly. You know, they care a lot more about what they're doing than what they look like. Also, they, they have a um, similar, in my experience, sense of humor, which is a bit awkward. They're, they don't have uh, the typical sense of humor. So they may laugh when people don't laugh. A, a typical people doesn't laugh. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's different. You know, they, they just look look and interact they're also socially awkward, so in the interactions, um, you know, they you might be a bit off uh, when you interact with them. Um, but they're also fascinating because precisely because of all these reasons, they contribute something different, you know, and they're more interesting people to be around. Uh, in terms of the mathematical and logical mind, I've just seen it over and over, you know. Engineer, the, good, the best engineers have a very mathematical mind because... Programming is very logical and very mathematical. Many artists have a very, very mathematical mind as well and logical. And they, they see harmony, you know, they, 
logic and order and symmetry and proportion, they're all mathematical concepts to some degree. And so great artists very often have that mind themselves, you know, that's why they can produce um, you know, art that is so perfect in many dimensions, right? Uh, and and, and it's, 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 if you go to music, for example, music is very, very mathematical uh, and, and, and it's of course a key, a key art dimension and uh, very typically engineers, tech engineers would have, would have a musical mind as well. I did once a survey and like 30 or 40 percent of the engineers I surveyed either were in a band or played an instrument or sang. You know, they, were, they had a close connection to music. And I, so I, I, I cannot explain why all of this is the case, but I have empirically seen that they are very similar. Yes, over and over. Well, after you put it that way, it changes my perception a bit because visual and geometry is also type of math, right? I was of an impression or what I observed was engineers have very dry, I mean, they are for profits and they are very calculative. Uh, they are not colorful. They just think very logically. They don't think maybe outside the box, but artists are always breaking barriers, uh, colors, a lot of colorful and breaking stereotypes and doing many, many things which are not expected or not sort of happening in the way. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, it, de it depends on how you frame the problem, right? Because well, engineers can tell you that they're super creative. They're figuring out ways to solve problems that nobody's used before. And they have a very analytical and creative mind. Actually, the better engineers are super creative, you know? Uh, even more, um, I'm not an engineer, so I cannot do what I'm going to describe now, but I know people can do. Really good engineers can look at code and they can tell you this is a very elegant code and this isn't. This code is beautiful and this code is not because of the simplicity and the, yeah, just the elegance in writing it. I actually once participated, uh, I don't know it wasn't, why it wasn't repeated, but in the Smithsonian Museum in New York, uh, there was an auction of uh, computer code. This was uh, organized by Artsy, so an art platform organized uh, an auction, an art auction of computer code. And uh, it was interesting because they were trying to come up with this idea that computer code could be one new dimension of art, just like painting and sculpture and photography and video, there would be a new one, which would be computer code. It didn't take off. I mean, everything was sold. There were 12 pieces and all of them were sold, but there wasn't a, a next phase. So I don't know why it didn't happen, but at least some people had this idea that there was an intersection clearly between computer code and art because they actually did this. You should check it out. S Smithsonian Museum. It happened like, uh, I would say, 15 years ago, something like that, 10 to 15 years ago in New York. Definitely, I've got to check out uh, Smithsonian Museum. Very interesting. Yeah, putting up art, uh, code as an artworks. <laughs> yes. And now, now we are in the world of generative art and people are actually using code to create art. I have uh, many artist friends who are from the financial and uh, coding background and they're just making artwork with the code. <laughs> so, yes, that is something very interesting. Uh, one question to you, what advice would you give to your younger self? Um, okay, so let me, let me think. Um, yeah, I would tell myself to dream big, to not punish me too much when I make mistakes. Um, to smile as much as I can, um, to only do things with people I admire and have fun with, um, uh, and to never, never give up. You know, if you fall, just stand up and continue. Don't look back. Man. Just uh, it's it's an adventure. You know, think of it as an adventure. You know, you're gonna make wrong turns. 
you're going to be, uh, you know, in the spots you don't like very much. But that, that, that's the fun of it, you know. You learn and continue. You know? It's a, uh, yeah. And it's a, it's a very cool, it's, it's a very cool adventure, eh? this, this thing, which we call life. Very cool adventure. Thank you so much, Alec, for being our guest. It was a wonderful and very insightful episode. Uh, any parting words you'd like to say to the audience? Yeah, I would just say that um, even though I'm Argentinian, uh, in my heart, uh, I have a, a little special place for India uh, because India was uh, such an important part of uh, my career through OLX. Uh, and I always felt that, you know, uh, India is such a such a special and unique country, you know, with the, not only the size and the culture, but the colors you have in India. In my, you know, that those colors come to my mind when I think of India. The color, it's a very colorful place. It's a place of I, smiles come to my face, you know, to my to my mind. The face is smiling, you know, and uh, it gave me a lot of, uh, you know, it made me very proud to to have participated in, in building that platform there and that so many people engaged and, and, and welcomed it. So thank you very much. My last words would be thank you very much. It's been a, a pleasure to be engaged uh, with, with you Indians and you uh, and, and, and your beautiful country. Really, I really appreciate it and I'm very happy. Thank you so much. One question from the personal side. You were, before the session, you were worried if how I'm going to survive through two hours and it's over two hours now. And just about your overall experience or a feedback for me, what would you say? Feedback for you? In, in, in what dimension? Sorry, Tanmay. Regarding this session, you thought oh. it would be, two hours would be too much. Yeah, and yeah. Um, no, I, I mean... I liked it. I felt super comfortable in this in this uh, session. It was long; it's two hours long, um, so it's intense. We covered all kinds of topics. But you are um, you you are very elegant in the way you manage this. You don't you're not you're not even though you touch all the topics, um, you're not aggressive like sometimes people are. Uh, you, you you smile, which is good. It makes people feel at ease. Uh, I think you're honest uh, and about your comments and uh, and and you have a uh, a nice nice way to to connect. You know, it's a it's a humble way. It's a, a not a, a hierarchical approach. So no, I, I think you should continue doing what you're doing, and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Really means a lot. Thank you. Bye bye.